Hello there, and welcome to this wholly gratuitous explication video for On Mars, a game for 2-4 to four players designed by Vital Lacerda with art by Ian O'Toole. I'll be using Tabletopia to show you around the various concepts and components of the game. We'll start with a quick overview of the game at large, then cover some of the more intricate and complicated aspects of the game. It's my hope that by the end of this video, you'll have a solid understanding of how to play On Mars, as well as a somewhat troubling uncertainty as to why you spent so long enduring the sound of my voice. Let's heave ho, shall we? On Mars is set in the not-too-distant future, wherein mankind has presumably borked up the Earth to such an extent that there's widespread extinction of such temperature-sensitive favorites as penguins, polar bears, and icicles. In short, we're in need of a new planet to ruin. For centuries, the red planet Mars has hung tantalizingly within our celestial heavens, mocking us with its more or less habitability just beyond the outstretched fingertips of our pitifully cosmosiverse forebears. But no longer. Thanks to the awesome power of imagination, plus a dash of science and technology, we've finally amassed the wherewithal to jump ship from one failing rock and leap to the next. Welcome, one and all, to our new home. Already rebranded to what one can only assume will end up being Coca-Cola Presents Disney's New Earth Plus Platinum Edition. Right, so maybe that's a slightly less optimistic version of the flavor text at the beginning of the rulebook, but all you really need to know is that we'll be playing as administrative head honchos in charge of various entities in charge of the colonization of Mars. Along the way, we'll be taking actions and pulling strings to grow our humble Martian colony to one of magnificent and self-sustaining proportions. Naturally, we do all this in the name of opportunity points, and whosoever earns the most of these shall be crowned overall victor, knighted with ample bragging rights for at least a week afterward. And now we arrive at the very crux of the game, the real heart and soul and pith of what makes On Mars unique. You'll notice our game board is divided into two distinct halves. The first five of our action spaces reside on the left-hand side, aboard the futuristic-looking space station that orbits the planet. If sci-fi nomenclatural foreshadowing is any indication, it's probably called something like the USS Achilles, or the Icarus, or New Pandora, or Station Blows Up at the End of Act Two. This orbital side is all about planning, forethought, and deliberation. Here, you'll be setting yourself up for future turns, selecting blueprints for the renovation of existing colony buildings, investing in and improving tech that will go on to boost your operations, and gathering building resources from a communal stockpile. On the other half of the board are the remaining five actions. This half is known as the colony side, the actual and rufescent surface of Mars, where putting all those plans into action will result in constructing life-sustaining buildings into our colony, upgrading and claiming those buildings for our own, taking on local specialists and export contracts, exploring the planet's terrain, and welcoming fresh new colonists to our rank who will promptly be wrenched from their honeymoon period by being put to work post-haste. Since we can't be in two places at once, we'll be spending the game hopping from one half of the board to the other, and back and forth and here and there and back again, all with the help of private shuttles, or, more than likely, the community shuttle, which flies to and fro for free, all while probably making the same sound as the Jetsons hover car. On Mars is played in an indefinite number of rounds, with each round being divided into two phases. First comes the colonization phase, in which we as players take turns in player order selecting one action from whatever side of the board we find ourselves on, then optionally selecting one executive action. Once everyone has performed their action along with optional executive action, we continue to the shuttle phase. This is when we'll check to see if the community shuttle is ready for takeoff. If it is indeed making a jaunt, each player that's currently on the same side as the shuttle token will have the opportunity to hitch a ride for free, and this, my friends, is the main way we'll position ourselves to partake in that proverbial grass that always seems to be greener on whatever side we're currently not on. Before we cover the actions that can be performed during the colonization phase, let's run through everything that happens in a typical shuttle phase. It might not make perfect sense just yet, but it'll all coalesce as we continue. Understand that a shuttle phase doesn't always mean the community shuttle will be making a trip. 
In the first half of the game, the colony is more dependent on the folks up in orbit, which means the shuttle scoots back and forth more frequently. Later in the game, however, once our community becomes more self-reliant and visiting space is no longer considered cool, the community shuttle won't be making its trip as often. First, we'll have to check to see if it's ready for takeoff. If the ship is on any white number, we'll simply move it forward one space and most likely continue on to our next colonization phase. However, if the shuttle is in fact ready to roll out on the red one space, each eligible player may now decide in player order to hitch a ride. In this case, the blue player and the purple player, since they're already on the same side the shuttle is launching from. Yellow and slightly different blue are already on the colony side, so if they want to return to orbit for free, they'll have to wait a couple more turns to do so. A couple of important things will trigger if and when each player decides to travel, and they're outlined in the very middle of the shuttle track. If you travel down from orbit to the colony, you tend to seed the surface with goodies that can later be scooped up during a rover excursion. Choose from one of two available exploration tiles on offer and place it out onto the board exactly three spaces away from your adorable little Mars rover meeple. All players' adorable little Mars rover meeples start on the very center hex, so early in the game most of you will be seeding exploration tiles near to everyone. The final and arguably most important thing you must do is retrieving your worker meeples. It'll become clearer later on as to why and how they've been spent in the first place, but just remember that using the shuttle will always allow you to unexhaust all of your exhausted worker meeples on your player mat. Then gather up all worker meeples that you've previously placed out onto the side of the board you're currently traveling to. Then the player will place their astronaut meeple onto one of the four open slots on the player order track, gaining any immediate bonus that they happen to cover up. If a player travels up from the colony to orbit, a slightly different sequence will trigger. First, instead of seeding out an exploration tile, the player produces resources from all building tiles on which he has either one of his wooden building tokens or worker meeples. In this particular case, because the blue player has one worker meeple on a mine, he produces a mineral and puts it on his player mat, plus two space crystals for his two shelters with building tokens on them, and one plant resource from the plant building he's also upgraded. Again, we'll go over upgrading buildings in more detail when we get to that action space. After you've produced from all your buildings, you now get to do the exact same process of unexhausting all exhausted worker meeples on your player mat, plus gathering back up all previously placed workers out on the board, but this time from the orbital side instead of the colony side. To help you remember, just think of how your lowly underlings would react if they heard their boss was stopping by for a surprise inspection. Obviously, if you visit orbit, only your orbit side workers would flee back to their homes for fear of getting caught slacking off, while anyone left behind on the colony would continue to loaf about, knowing their manager was currently in transit some hundreds of miles away. I want to stress that the exact reasons and ramifications of why these things happen probably won't quite make sense to you right now but it'll all suss out as we continue to explain the game. I promise. Since we're up here at the top of the board already, now's a good time to note the player order track, which is also divided into an orbital and colony side. Whenever we need to resolve things in player order, like when we take our actions or who gets to shuttle first, we'll refer to our little astronaut meeples on this track. It reads from left to right, which means that, as I'm sure you've already deduced, when taking actions, orbital side will always get to go first, and then colony. This of course makes a big difference when you do your shuttling, because placing your astronaut meeple on one of the available empty spaces may grant you an immediate bonus outside of your turn, but it also means that you may end up going after other players when taking actions. And in On Mars, timing is everything. Speaking of timing, I'm going to stretch my amazing segue skills to talk about game end triggers. We'll be playing these rounds, consisting of the colonization phases and shuttle phases, until we manage to complete three randomized end game missions. You'll find these missions placed neatly around the edge of the Mars map, and they're tailored to specific player count. You can mix and match the various requirements for a longer or shorter game, but generally speaking, they'll ask you to accomplish a certain aspect of the game. When you do, you're awarded space crystals for extra incentive, which is one great way of affording those amazing executive actions before or after your normal turn. 
Basically, think of these missions as the whims of your boss's boss, still based on Earth, and trying to run an interplanetary company from the sun-scorched golf links. For example, in a four-player game, this mission card is from one of our many CEOs, who just recently listened to a podcast or some TED Talk waxing philosophic on the subject of corporate scientists, and now he's convinced it should be our number one priority to grab up as many as we possibly can. And who are we to judge? He's offering a big nice bonus every time we manage to sate his current obsession. So let's get to scientisting the heck out of our colony. Now I know what you're thinking. What if none of us want to take scientists this game? Never fear, for even if all of you end up slacking off in any one of these missions, which is highly unlikely, then the ever-increasing colony level has got you covered. As the game progresses and more and more buildings are built, the colony will naturally expand and grow, and once it starts getting really big, it'll automatically bump forward the three mission card requirements one by one, regardless if we're focusing on completing them or not. All of this to say, the game will end whether you like it or not and most likely way before you're ready for it to. So how exactly does this so-called colony level increase, and what are all those doodads and widgets, and how can you manipulate them to your advantage? Well, we'll come back to that little quadrant of the board once we explain constructing buildings. Spoiler alert, you'll want to construct buildings. <laughs> Right, I'm sure you're ready and raring to hear all about those action spaces, aren't you? Well, this wouldn't be a Vital Lacerda game without at least half a hundred interconnected puzzle pieces whose explanations require the previous knowledge of other explanations that you haven't yet heard. So bear with me while I put that particular topic off for just a little while longer. I think knowing your way around your player map first might help contextualize the rest of what you can do. So let's travel there now using the Community Shuttle. Disclaimer, traveling to your player mat does not in fact require the use of the community shuttle and may be regarded or utilized at any time at no cost to you, the user. Let's go. Ah, the noble player mat. It wouldn't be a true Euro board game without one, and On Mars proves no exception. Here you'll find all your available resources, space crystals, executive actions, private shuttles, laboratory, shelter tiles yet to be built, shelter tiles already built into affordable housing for your workforce and workforce both currently made available and unavailable to you. I realize that's a lot of information to digest all at once, and like any unknown quantity, is super scary at first glance, the mounting urge to flee in terror seeming wisest and most prudent. So let's do so, and only return when it becomes especially relevant to each individual aspect. But before we run screaming, I'll point your attention to the bottom right, where the worker meeples are standing. The housing and work area compartments are important to distinguish from one another, as both placing out and exhausting your workers are an integral part of taking actions, which we'll be discussing presently. Now, let's get to the safety of those action spaces, shall we? Ah, the noble action space. It wouldn't be a true Euro worker placement board game without one, and On Mars proves no exception. Actually, On Mars does prove to be a slight exception, that exception accepting how worker placement usually works. Leaning in for a closer look, you'll notice that the circular action spaces in On Mars look slightly different from one another. This is because depending on the action space, the requirements to go there will differ in cost and power. When attempting to take an action on your turn, always refer to the top reddish portion and bottom bluish half. The top tells you whether or not you are required to physically place one of your available workers in order to carry out the action. If there exists a worker icon, you'll need to do so. If there's a red X, simply state that you're choosing the action space and execute it, leaving your worker meeples to breathe a sigh of relief. Similarly, the bottom half will indicate whether or not you may repeat the action multiple times by exhausting additional resources. In this instance, this action space does not require you to place out one of your available workers. Simply state you'd like to take the action and do it once. Then, for every worker you exhaust on your player mat from available to unavailable, you may repeat the action that many times. The sky's the limit, or more specifically, the number of your available workers are. Thematically, you're sending your workers into the workshops, and they'll be tied up carrying out that task until such a time as you are able to bring them back home after a long day's work. Always place and exhaust your worker meeples with care. You don't want to be without them when a very specific action needs doing. 
Be aware, too, that some action spaces might require you to spend space crystals instead of exhausting workers in order to carry out the action multiple times, and many very powerful actions don't allow you to do them more than just once. And remember, the main way to get your worker meeples back to their rightful, available state is to hop onto a shuttle and travel to the other side of the board during that shuttle phase, though there are some slightly more efficient and delightfully clever ways to get around that general rule. Now, unlike most worker placement games, just because an action space is already full of workers doesn't mean it's now unavailable to you. Whenever you would place a worker in order to take an action, first, count the number of different player color meeples already present. In order to go there, you must now pay that many space crystals or exhaust that many worker meeples on your player mat. Your choice. However, if all spots are currently full, you first kick back all workers of the majority player color, then calculate your placement costs from those workers still remaining. A three-way tie in majority player color results in all workers being kicked back to their respective owners in an exhausted state, which means no additional placement cost to you, and gaining the reputation of snitching out your fellow coworkers whenever you see them lounging around the water cooler for too long. Hey, remember how I promised I'd get around to explaining the actual actions and what they do? I think we're finally ready. Let's start with the orbital side, as it's the most straightforward. At the very top, we have our requisite, I really don't want to, but sometimes I'll have to, action. Awarded the highly prestigious, I really don't want to, but sometimes I'll have to, award for excellence in, I really don't want to, but sometimes I'll have to, istic tendencies. It's simple enough. Use your entire action this turn to drop down from orbit to the colony side immediately, without the use of a private or community shuttle. You still trigger the regular shuttle phase ability to unexhaust all your workers and pick up any that have been placed on the planet side, but you have to skip placing out an exploration tile of your choice. Apparently the abject terror of a supersonic freefall from outer space doesn't allow much time for sightseeing. Next up, take a blueprint. Here, you'll have to drop off a worker meeple, paying any costs for already present workers, before choosing one of the available blueprint cards that's in the display. Get the free resource at the bottom, place the card next to your player mat, drop one of your wooden buildings onto it to show it's not yet built, and exhaust any number of additional workers to repeat the whole process. Now's a great time to talk about what blueprint cards can do for you. In a word, upgrade. But why stop at one word when you can employ literally dozens more to discuss in excruciating detail? The fact of the matter is that blueprint cards are incredibly useful. Not only does owning one allow you to upgrade a building tile out on the board, but doing so allows you to stake your claim on it by placing one of your little wooden building tokens. And, if you'll recall, this enables you to start producing the good of that building type whenever you trigger production. Owning upgraded buildings will also qualify you for earning endgame points from them, given you have the right contracts and scientists. But it doesn't stop there. Once the building has been upgraded, keep your blueprint card close by, and it'll offer a brand new, entirely unique executive action just for you. An executive action that's superlatively powerful, often doubling the amount of things you can accomplish in a single turn. Let's take a quick look at the anatomy of a blueprint card. At the top, you'll see that all blueprint cards cost one mineral resource in order to build. Remember, the cost of one mineral is only when you take the upgrade action, not when you take the blueprint card initially. You can also see at a glance their building level, which has to do with the size of the complex you're attempting to upgrade. We'll learn more about complexes once we talk about building. Furthermore, their color indicates the type of building tile you may upgrade, and the middle shows you the special executive action that is unlocked after you make good on that upgrade. All executive actions on blueprint cards cost two space crystals to activate, or a specific type of scientist when visiting this card allows you to take the executive action free of charge. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, we'll learn more about scientists a little later. Finally, Upgraded blueprint cards always grant their owners three or five victory points at the end of the game, but don't hoard too many of them, as they run the risk of costing their owners negative three or negative five points if they're never built. The next action space is Learn New Technology. 
There's no need to place out a worker meeple for this one, but you are allowed to exhaust another worker to take the action more than once. In order to gain a new technology tile, first pay the cost depending on the tier. Free, one battery resource, or one battery resource plus one additional resource of your choice. Then, take the tile and place it into one of the available leftmost slots in your laboratory on your player mat. When you cover up a pre-printed icon on a tech tile slot, you immediately get that bonus for free. Here, the slightly different blue player will receive a shiny new space crystal for unlocking the awesome power of Mars rovering. And hey, since we're already here, let's have a little chat about how obtaining space crystals works. Usually, when you receive a new resource throughout your turn, it's put into its respective spot in your player mat storage and is available for use that very instant. Not so with space crystals, represented here on Tabletopia by these demonstrably uncrystalline looking cylinders. Whenever a player obtains space crystals during his turn, he must first store them at the very bottom of his space crystal storage. Ludologically speaking, this means you can't actually use a space crystal on the turn in which you get it. Thematically speaking, space crystals must first be spent to the space refinery before they're cut into their final aesthetically pleasing and user-friendly form. It'll take until the very end of your turn before you can slide them upwards and into one of the open slots, and only then are you free to squander them to your heart's content. Just remember, you can take as many space crystals as you want during your turn, but the space refinery will only send back as many as you can store, and the delivery will be made only after you've finished up being productive for the day. Also, technically, the rulebook officially identifies these space crystals as Marzenum. Mar Marzenum? Mars Marcinium. Space crystals. They're space crystals. Do you like spending space crystals but hate touching them because they're icky? Every player begins the game with three personal objective cards. While they can only accomplish one of them to take advantage of a bonus of their choice, you can always spend as many cards as you like in place of space crystals. Now, back to the lab. Just how do you advance these darn tech tiles to make room for more? Gee, I'm so glad you asked, because you just provided me with yet another amazing segue. The next orbital action is research and development. Here is where you'll be pushing your technology to its limits. You'll note that the action requires you to place out a worker meeple onto the board in order to activate it, and you're always free to exhaust more to take the action over and over. Each activation allows you two advancements, and you can choose to split that movement between two different tiles. Just choose an applicable tech tile, slide it forward to an open space, and pay the cost and resources near the top of the new column. Again, if it covers up a pre-printed icon in the process, you immediately get that bonus for free. The orange number at the very top of the column isn't a modifier of cost, but rather indicates the power level of the technologies underneath and the number at the very bottom of the column will award you victory points at the end of the game. What's more, some of the bonus spaces even trigger an entire free grab a blueprint or upgrade a building action within your main turn, so depending on how you time it, you can really get a lot accomplished just by letting science do its thing. But just because the blue player went and nabbed the water building technology tile before the slightly different blue player had a chance to, doesn't mean the slightly different blue player is out of luck. No, just like in real life, one man's breakthrough is the whole world's gain. As long as any one player has the technology on their player mat, everyone can utilize its power level. And this is where the real back-scratching symbiosis of On Mars comes into play. It pays to invest, quite literally, as you're awarded a kickback every time any other player chooses to utilize one of your technologies. As soon as they announce so, you get your choice of one air resource, free of charge, or, after their turn is complete, you can slide that technology forward, ignoring all costs. So go ahead, be the patent troll of Mars, and sit back, chuckling gleefully as you watch your various technologies hop, skip, and leap forward into futurity without ever having to pay resources or precious actions to do so. I'll be sure to point out what each technology tile does just as soon as we cover the actions they improve. But know for now that as a general rule, the higher their power level, the bigger and better the action will be. And lo, at long last, we arrive at the final orbital action space. Resupply. 
This is a cheap and easy way of getting more resource tiles, except for minerals, which always act as a wild resource and would be far too easy if you could just walk into a store and buy. Announce you're taking the resupply action without placing out a worker meeple, and take one available resource of your choice, except for minerals. Additional resources, except for minerals, may be acquired with every worker you exhaust on your player mat. That's just the sort of customer-first, quality experience you can come to expect from our little ye old mom-and-pop resource supply shop, but don't bother asking them if they can order any minerals because they've already asked the supplier and the answer was no. Also, however strong the Euro gaming habit may be, don't you dare slide the remaining resources down and refill after your turn. Believe you me, that resource depot will get picked clean quicker than you can say, hey, someone build the last life support system building so we can finally refill this ding dang resource depot. But don't you dare refill that resource depot until such an event occurs. More on when that event occurs a little later. Do remember that whenever you see this resource depot symbol, you're obliged to take from the available selection at the depot on the board, for better or worse. For all other instances of obtaining resources, such as production, you may take tiles from the general supply off-board, which is, for all intents and purposes, inexhaustible. These resources obviously come from various wormholes connecting to multiverses that are real big on littering, randomly fortuitous asteroid debris, and abandoned international space stations that have recently crashed onto the planet's surface for lack of anything better to do. Obviously. What ho, we're finally halfway through, and it's only going to get more complicated from here. Let's hop aboard that shuttle and start putzing about on Mars before we give up entirely. Ah, Mars, the red planet, the planet that never sleeps, the Big Apple, the, the Jewel of the Nile. I'm pretty sure those are all Mars nicknames, but in any event, we finally landed. After everyone's shoulders have been appropriately festooned with space lays, let's head on over to the first of the five action spaces that make up the colony side. Ready? Alrighty. The first action space is... Only the most complicated action in the whole entire game. Let's, uh, let's leave that one till the very end, shall we? I promise it'll all be worth it, and knowing the other four before we get to building and upgrading will not only give you a better sense of the game beforehand, but will allow me to put off the inevitable. Deal? Deal. Alrighty, the last action space is Welcome New Colonists which allows one to welcome new colonists and gain private shuttles. Announce the action without placing a worker onto the board and pay the newcomers what they want, water to drink and a potted plant to admire. Then unlock your choice of either two new worker meeples from the stock onto your player mat or one new worker meeple and one brand spanking new builder bot, which will henceforth be referred to as the builder bot that looks suspiciously like Johnny Five of short circuit fame. Worker meeples go in the living quarters, provided you have enough space for them, and builder bots that look suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame appear out on the board, on one of your unoccupied shelter tiles. Finally, choose any one of the spaceship tokens from the left side of your player mat and place it in your hangar. This is now a private shuttle, which can be kept until the end of the game to give you three points, or spent during a shuttle phase to hop over to the opposite side of the board regardless of where you are in relation to the community shuttle. The private shuttle you chose to unlock will also uncover a brand new executive action for you to take as well. They'll always cost an ungodly number of space crystals in order to execute, but the spaceship token's absence has now made room for one additional space crystal to be stored, so there's always that. Remember that you can always perform exactly one executive action before or after your regular turn and you unlock more to choose from by either upgrading blueprint cards or welcoming new colonists. Technology tile alert! You can take advantage of the welcome new colonists tech during this action to boost the number of worker meeples you receive. For example, if the purple player has upgraded her tech tile to a power level of plus three, you can add up to three additional worker meeples to either of your original options and at the original price. Apparently science has allowed us to unlock the awesome power of the clown car. Who needs legroom in economy class anyhow? Just keep in mind that you'll still need enough space in your living quarters to house them all, and if you use Purple's tech, you'll be giving her a free air resource or allowing her to upgrade that tech tile yet again. 
If you can't or would rather not use tech, you can always do this action multiple times provided you can afford the resources and exhausted workers. But always remember this. New colonists simply won't move into your tract housing no matter how amazing it is if the colony level isn't high enough. You can only welcome as many ships as the current colony level. So if you and the other players haven't expanded enough, there's no incentive for new neighbors to start moving in. Heck, there's got to be at least one super gentrified East End and half a dozen Olive Garden restaurants before that third or fourth ship will even think about settling down in our neck of the woods. Of course, when I say neck of the woods, you must realize I'm employing what we in the business like to call a figure of speech. Turns out there's no woods whatsoever on the surface of Mars, a fact you'll soon see for yourself when you take the next action in line. Control Center. This is the space for exploration and conquest, and boy howdy, look at all that stuff you can explore and conquer. Why, we've barely even arrived, and already the human race has set to work littering random bits of cardboard and plastic all over the planet. But hey, unlike Earth's stinking landfills of rotten folderol and soiled nappies, at least this trash is worth our while. Announce you're taking this action, and you can move both your builder bots that look suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame, and your adorable little rover meeples up to two spaces each. That is to say, you get two points of movement amongst all of your builder bots that look suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame, and two points of movement for your one and only adorable little rover meeple. Use them wisely, or don't, and pay extra space crystals for extra expensive movement. You'll want to move your builder bots that look suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame because they, like their name implies, look suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame, sure, but also will be doing all of your building for you. Position them ahead of time in order to reach only the choicest hexes of Martian real estate. You'll want to move your adorable little rover meeple because it has the ability to vacuum up all those delicious looking bits of cardboard and plastic. Yes, at long last, the mystery of why you spit out exploration tiles during your shuttle flight down to Mars has finally been solved. Whenever your adorable little rover meeple ends its movement on a hex with an exploration tile on it, you get that tile to use immediately. The bonuses range from receiving free resources to activating whole entire actions within your normal action, so get out there and get hoovering. Although you can only grab one tile per control center action, any and all space crystals that your adorable little rover meeple drives over go straight to your space refinery for later use, so the more circuitous your journey, the better. Technology tile alert! Speaking of circuitous, let's heap even more movement points into your adorable little rover meeple by taking advantage of the appropriate tech tile. Its current power level is the number of extra hexes it can scoot, so upgrade it enough times, and eventually science will birth a rocket-powered buggy able to cross half a planet's worth of terrain in a single bound. Finally, unlike rovers, your builder bots outright destroy the little bits and bobs they run over. Whoops. Due to an unplanned consequence of scientific pomposity, humankind has empowered the average builder bot that looks suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame to such a degree that it no longer knows its own strength. Should one barrel over a space crystal or exploration tile in a fit of Herculean trundling, the offending piece will be instantaneously pulverized into a cloud of unidentifiable space detritus and be rendered completely unusable. Remove it from the board as you cackle maniacally, drawing the ire and multifarious swearing of the others who are gunning for it. Now let's meet the men and women who have made possible this unholy union of death and destruction. Yes, it's time for the next action space. Hire a scientist, or take an Earth contract. But what's this? A worker placement bank hitherto unexplained? No worries, as it works only slightly differently from those you've already witnessed. It does indeed require you to place out a worker meeple onto the board, but you'll see that there's only one space per player color, reserved parking as it were. This simply means that, like a junior high co-ed dance, there'll be no bumping whatsoever of the attendees. If you haven't already, place your worker meeple in the appropriate color space and take this action exactly once. You now have your choice of any remaining scientist card, complete with scientist meeple, or an earth contract on offer. Each scientist represents one of the five different resources in the game. They have fancy pants scientific names, naturally, but why not just call them by their color like the obvious non-fancy pants layman that we are? The cost for each scientist is exactly two resources of the previous type, 
So if you want to employ that fancy pants geochemist slash gray lady that graduated at the top of her class from Mars Community College, you'll have to furnish her with two houseplants as salary. Every scientist you hire will grant you two things. Endgame points for a very specific type of upgraded building once all is said and done, and a during game benefit of making executive actions of same colored blueprint cards free of charge. That's right, if you've been hoarding and upgrading a ton of air buildings, then you can place your Grey Lady on any one of them and take the executive action without having to pay the regular cost of two space crystals. Not only that, but you can even visit other players' completed blueprint cards in the same way, and in a magical explosion of scientific friendship, the owner will also get their executive action for free just as long as the meeple remains there. Once a scientist card is taken, it's immediately replaced with an Earth contract of the buyer's choice. Earth contracts are a little more straightforward and come in two flavors. One requires you to ship specific resources by the end of the game for a big points payout, while the other type asks its owner to be part of a specific complex of buildings before the game is through. Both reward forward planning and careful mastery of the taken Earth contract action space, and always come at the cost of one space crystal. The good news is that you pretty much know how to do the next action space already. Upgrade a building. The bad news is that I'm going to describe it to you again, just to be on the safe side. When taking this action, you'll need to qualify for three to four things. First, there needs to be an available building tile within at least one tile of your builder bots that look suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame. Second, you'll need an unbuilt blueprint card of the matching resource type. And third, you'll have to pay the requisite cost of one mineral. If your blueprint card is a level 1 upgrade, you're all set. However, if the blueprint card you wish to use is a level 3, the tile you're upgrading must be a part of a building complex of at least three identical tiles. Assuming all of these demands are met, you may now take your wooden building token from the blueprint card and place it on the building tile in question. Congratulations! This building has not only been upgraded to its full potential with working toilets and everything, but it's also got your name on it for purposes of scoring points and producing goods from here on out. It's just like that wise old Latvian proverb, Mi casa es su casa, except when mi casa es upgraded. Technology Tile Alert! Normally, this action space only allows for one measly upgrade per action, but if anyone owns the upgrade building tech tile, a player may utilize it to make as many upgrades as its current power level. Heck, I'm all for science if science can actually guarantee the contractors show up on time. Just as a quick recap, upgrading a building tile has all sorts of benefits. You get the new executive action of the blueprint card that was just used, plus its endgame points, plus you get to claim the actual building tile, plus that building tile will produce one good for you during a shuttle flight over to orbit side, plus each scientist will score its owner points for all upgraded buildings of a specific type, regardless of who actually upgraded them. So upgrade early and upgrade often, lest you become the only person on Mars in On Mars to be operating out of ramshackle huts and rusty lean-tos. You might think the rustic look lends a certain je ne sais quoi, but the Joneses are totally judging you. But now the moment you've all been waiting for. It is time. Time to discuss the building of On Mars. I can see you trembling in anticipation, and frankly it's making me uncomfortable, so I'll proceed without further preamble. To take a construct a building action, place out a worker meeple on the board and do it exactly once. Sadly, there's no sly workaround to exhaust workers, spend space crystals, or exploit tech in order to break this rule. Then follow these five steps, each lovingly outlined in meticulous detail for your express pleasure. Number one, choose a type of building to construct. Remember, there are five main resource generating buildings, plus your personal shelters, and each type of building directly supports the next in a cyclical fashion. Minerals are used in the production of batteries, batteries furnish the power needed to purify water, water grows plants, plants create oxygen, Oxygen is needed to, you know, live and junk, and people are put to work in the mines just as soon as they turn 13 years of age. In other words, just your average run-of-the-mill circle of life stuff. 
For purposes of this example, let's choose to build a mine, because mines are neat. Number two, pay its cost. There's no such thing as a free lunch, and that applies to building tiles too, though I'd caution you not to eat building tiles no matter how delicious they may appear. A building type will always cost one resource of the building type before it. If you can't be bothered to commit this to memory, there's a handy dandy cheat sheet right below the building tile supply. The one exception to this being your personal shelter tiles. They reside on your player mat until built, but you still build them just like any other building tile. They have an air resource printed on their backsides to remind you of their cost. In the case of our example, our mine is going to cost us one available worker meeple from our living quarters. Number three, place the tile. Here's the trickiest step in all of On Mars, but since we've saved it for last, theoretically it should make the most amount of sense to you with the least likelihood of me having to repeat the phrase, but we'll get to that later. First and foremost, wherever you want to build, just like when upgrading, you'll only be able to if it's adjacent to or directly underneath one of your builder bots that looks suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame, so be sure to carefully position them ahead of time. When placing a building tile, you have one of two options. You can either build into an existing cluster of like buildings, something we already know to be called a complex, or place it all by its lonesome, exactly two hex spaces away from a like building tile, allowing it to do its own thing. The latter requires no extra prerequisites, so if that's what you want to do, you can skip right on down to the next step. More often than not, however, you'll want to take advantage of the former, and building into a complex means we finally get to cover the final technology tile alert. At the surprise of absolutely no one, we reveal that the last remaining tech type to cover is tied to constructing buildings. In order to expand a complex of building tiles, at least one player in the game must own that type of building tech. Its current power level is the number of additional building tiles that can be added around the original. Simply put, a mine building tech at plus three means, at most, three other mine building tiles can surround the initial mine. If you use someone else's tech in expanding a complex, and they choose to upgrade that tech at the end of their turn, that means someone else can swoop in immediately and expand the complex further. If you use your own tech to expand a complex, everyone will groan and curse your name because they'll have to wait around until you upgrade it via some other means before they can take advantage of it again. Make sense? Always, always, always remember to check before building whether the complex you're eyeing can legally and technically be expanded. There's nothing worse than getting to step three only to realize someone's water building science is still stuck in the Stone Age or even worse, doesn't even exist yet. For the purposes of our example, let's expand the current central mine complex since the blue player owns and has adequately upgraded the tech for us to do so. Since it's a mine, it cost us a worker meeple instead of the usual resource tile. We'll place that worker meeple on the mine tile itself to indicate that we are currently operating it and will produce a mineral whenever we trigger our production. Mines are a special case in this respect, Normally, nothing would be placed out onto a normal building tile when it is constructed. Gee, it's almost like we chose to construct a mine for our example specifically so as to cover this exact and somewhat situational side rule. Number four, seed out space crystals. If the building tile on the top of the pile has little arrows with space crystals pointing out in three directions, place from the supply three space crystals in all adjacent hex that don't already have something in them. It's okay if your tile doesn't have the symbols on it. It just means it's a bit of a late bloomer, and some of the greatest building tiles who ever lived were late bloomers. Abraham Lincoln, for instance, I'm pretty sure. Number five, gain resources. Here's one of the best steps of all. Count up the number of buildings in the complex you just built or expanded, then gain that many of its resources. Since we just built the fourth mine in our complex, we get a whopping four minerals from the general supply. Be sure to take as many as you can currently hold, which is, in case you've forgotten or temporarily misplaced that bit of information in the overwhelming maelstrom of recent stimuli, the number of shelters you've built plus one. I definitely already told you this information and totally didn't just now remember to mention it for the first time ever. In our sad and sorry case, we'll have to turn away that fourth mineral since we haven't quite built out enough affordable housing and thus lack the closet space. Yay, resources! Number six, place a progress cube. This is where the steps start getting more and more exclusive. 
You'll always follow through the preceding five steps every time you build, but from here on out, the steps only apply to you depending on what type of building you've just constructed. To wit, if and only if this is your first time constructing one of the non-shelter building types, you're eligible to place out one of your progress cubes. Take the cube underneath the type of building from your player mat and add it underneath that building type column on the LSS portion of the board. Welcome to the First Timers Club. Now you'll start raking in the points every time the colony level is increased. Number 7. Advance the Life Support Systems track, gaining bonuses if eligible. Again, this only happens in certain circumstances. If you just built one of the currently required life support system building types, you may move the marker of its column upward one space and earn its bonuses. The colony needs specific types of buildings to really thrive, and although mines and shelters are all well and good, they simply don't cut the mustard in this particular case. In order to actually grow our little community into a big one with a highly gentrified East End and half a dozen Olive Garden restaurants, we'll need to focus most on what makes life worth living. Power, water, plants, and air. These are the four core building types that push our colony into bigger and better things. Every time one of us builds one of these buildings, it pushes its marker up the appropriate track, and as soon as the last of the four markers reaches the same level as the colony level marker, the colony officially advances. If the marker of the building type you just constructed advances past the current colony level, nothing happens, and your construct a building action is finally complete. Good job with that new battery factory and all, but we were all really hoping for a new greenhouse instead, to be honest. If, however, your hard work aligns with the needs of the people, and you advance the track of a building type that is currently below the colony marker, you are showered with praise and adulation from your peers, and they throw you a big party with lots of in-game bonuses. And really, isn't that the whole reason we do anything in life? For the in-game bonuses? In hindsight, building that mine seems kind of lame, doesn't it? Instead of getting all those minerals, we could have showed how the final two steps really work. Let's get in our time machine, since those totally exist now in the not-too-distant future, and do it all over again. Only this time around, instead of being all selfish and such, we give in to the altruistic tendencies of a true saint and choose to build what the people want. A brand new air building. Are you ready? From the top. Now would you look at that, according to the life support systems portion of the board, it'd only take one more air building to make the whole entire colony advance to the next level. Let's take the construct a building action space to do so. We place out a worker meeple onto the board, but because it's full up, we'll kick back both of Blue's workers since he was in the majority. Now we only have to pay one space crystal or exhaust one of our worker meeples on our player mat since there's only one color remaining. Choosing the top air building tile from the supply, we note that it'll cost us one plant resource tile, which we pay only slightly begrudgingly, muttering all the while about the price of things these days and how we remember when depression era air buildings only cost two pennies and were at least the length of a child sized rat. Examining the state of Mars, we notice we have just one builder bot that looks suspiciously like Johnny Five of Short Circuit fame on the board, but luckily it's nice and adjacent to the pre existing air building complex. We could start a new complex exactly two hexes away, but then that wouldn't trigger the LSS marker, so we decide to further conform to societal pressures by expanding the air complex that's already been started. Since it's a complex of two tiles, we'll need someone to own the air building technology tile that's been upgraded to at least the plus two column. We are adding the second additional building, hence plus two. Luckily, the slightly different blue player has got exactly that, so we announce to him or her that we'll be using their technology for this action. Delighted, he or she does a small jig and decides to upgrade the tech tile for free at the end of our turn, eschewing the alternative of acquiring a free air resource instead. We go about our merry way and place the brand new air building tile just so, seeding out two of the three space crystals that its back tells us we can place. And hot dog, now we've got our sweet, sweet air payout. Since we've made a complex of three air tiles overall, we get three air resources for our trouble. 
Unfortunately, the Windfall turns out to be more of a tepid to room temperature sort of dog, as we can only hold up to two of those air tiles since our supply limit caps out at three. Our number of built shelters plus one. Sadly, we are not permitted to breathe the leftover air and instead chuck it in the trash. But can you believe it? This is our very first air building we've ever constructed, which means we can take the progress cube beneath our air supply, which is as far as we can tell completely unaffiliated with the circa 1980s soft rock duo, and place said cube in our player color spot on the appropriate air column of the LSS area. The prophecy at last fulfilled, the marker, being below the current colony level, advances upward, marking the fourth and final marker to reach the colony level marker, which will cause the colony level to advance at the end of our turn. Before we do this, we get to take one of the four available bonuses in the upper left corner, only because we successfully moved the air marker upward, and we choose to immediately retrieve one of our worker meeples from out on the board. Lastly, we score points for the air track's special scoring condition. In this case, two points for every ship we've welcomed into our hangar, which is, in this case, just one so far. Yay, two points! The colony rejoices and a ticker tape parade is held in our honor, or, more realistically, the colony level advances. Before anyone else can take their turn, we advance the colony level marker, gain victory points depending on how many progress cubes we've all placed, push the game end countdown marker one space closer regardless of the progress we've made on the three mission cards, restock the orbital supply depot, flush and refill the blueprint card area, and note with a creeping existential dread that the community shuttle will now take even longer to make its flight to and from the two halves of the board. And that, my friends, is the Construct a Building action. Several friendly reminders to beat against your brow. You get free resources for constructing new building tiles, not when you upgrade an already existing building tile using a blueprint. You move the LSS marker upwards and score the top bonuses on the LSS track when you build into a complex, not if you start your own isolationist movement two hexes away. And if no one has the appropriate building type technology, no one can build into that type of complex yet. Get the heck over to orbit and start upgrading, or the colony will never have the chance to advance. Finally, if you see a player attempting to manipulate the space-time continuum for fun and profit, please report them. Time travel is a finable offense. All that's left to discuss now is the end game. As soon as the game end counter reaches zero, either by all three mission cards being completed or the colony level reaching its final form, Finish out the current round so all players have had an equal number of turns. Then, one final colonization phase is played, and endgame scoring occurs. The handy-dandy endgame scoring track will guide you on your way. First, score points depending on the number of your progress cubes. Next, add three points per welcomed ship still in your personal hangar. Next, retrieve all worker meeples from the side of the board on which you ended the game, unexhaust all workers on your player mat, and fill your living quarters from bottom to top with this number. You now get the points printed on the topmost shelter in which you have at least one worker meeple. Next, receive points for each tech tile in your laboratory. Add up all the points on the blueprint cards you were able to build, subtracting points for any blueprint cards you were unable to upgrade. Now, take a look at your scientist cards. Each one will score for a specific building type, awarding three points for every one of these tiles that has been upgraded, regardless of who upgraded it. As long as it has a building token on it, you get the points. Finally, add up all of your completed Earth contracts, subtracting any negative points for those left incomplete. Tally up your scores. Politely humor the person in last place, as he or she inevitably makes some futile comment about how they wish it was golf scores. Then anoint the true victor their well-deserved title of Supreme High Chancellor Tyrant of On Mars Esquire. Congratulations! You've now played On Mars, and aren't you special? Why, yes. Yes, you are. That's it. You've made it through, or at least skimmed to the very end. On Mars is a complex beast, but don't let its reputation or breadth scare you away from trying it out. And never be afraid to make mistakes. 
always remember, you haven't truly played a game until you've played it wrong at least once. A special thanks goes out to the fine folks at Tabletopia and Eagle Griffin Games for providing the online version of this game to be played for free. Thank you also to Vital Lacerda for continually twisting and burning our brains in the best possible way, and Ian O'Toole for making the ensuing scorch marks look exceedingly stylish. If you've enjoyed this format and would like to see more, please consider engaging with and supporting this channel. Thanks for watching.